Hi, I'm Tyson Franklin, and welcome to this week's episode of the Podiatry Legends Podcast, a podcast designed to help you feel, see, and think differently about the podiatry profession. With me today is Simon Rebelko, and he has a very interesting story. He is a Canberra podiatrist, and he's just recently opened up My Podiatrist Canberra, and within his clinic, he also has a nail surgery clinic called Ingrown Toenail Care. But prior to becoming a podiatrist, Simon was in the Australian Army, and later studied and worked as a crime scene investigator. Oh, this is going to be an exciting conversation. So, Simon, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you, Bart. Glad to be here, mate. Yeah, well, we came across each other on LinkedIn initially. Yeah, that's right. And I read your profile. As soon as I saw that you were a crime scene investigator beforehand, straight away, all the music played in my head. <laughs> uh, din -din -din -din, all that. CSI, were you? I was thinking CSI straight away, and I thought, yeah. this is going to be really interesting. And then also, so I want to go through your career a little bit, and yeah, then sure. what got you into podiatry. You initially started in the Australian Army. Yeah, so, yeah, I joined the Army after school. As soon as I got my HSC results, I came from a strict Ukrainian family, wasn't sure what sort of marks I was getting, so I thought I better join the army just in case. Yeah. So yeah, went off to Kaduka, joined the army, and yeah, did I did a year full time with the army, and I did reserves for the army first, which was brilliant. Are you still in the reserves now? No, no, not nowadays. I sort of left when I joined the police. So I was a civilian with the police. So I started New South Wales police, and then later AFP. Okay, and that's where the the whole crime scene investigator. That's right. Uh, started. Yeah. What What was that like? What What's it like walking to a crime scene? Is it anything like we see on TV? Uh, no, yeah, uh, not really. Not really, actually. Like, you get there and TV has to be finished in half an hour. So everything's, yeah. uh, everything's sort of sped up. Now, like, in real life, you get there and you're, you're in this scene for hours trying to find things. And, you know, sometimes scenes can be quite confronting, you might have blood, gore, things like this, but yeah, you're, you're there for hours collecting evidence. Okay. So what, when you were doing that, did you ever yeah. watch, did you ever watch any of the crime scene investigator shows and, well, as, and have a bit of a laugh with it? Just be like, yeah, be like bit. podiatrist watching a movie and all yeah. of a sudden there's a podiatrist definitely, in there. Definitely, definitely. And it'd be the worst, it'd be the worst when you'd have people say, Oh, on CSI, they do it like this. And you're like, okay, that's cool. That's a TV show. In real life, we do it like this. But yeah, you, you'd sometimes, you'd sometimes like, I'd watch it, but I was lucky. I got into forensics the year before CSI started on TV. Oh, so, right. Okay. Before it became sexy. Yeah. So when I got into it, no one knew what it was. So I was actually in the second group of civilians ever to be uh, trained in forensics. Okay. It was probably a good time to get into that field, but nowadays near impossible. If you've got uh, kids or friends that, with kids who are wanting to do forensics, I'd say don't do it. But yeah, back then it was it was sort good of advice. A months of being there. Yeah. Yeah, I had a patient come in who was a crime scene investigator as well. Oh yeah. And I remember them saying that when they did it at university, they said that they got in really early and went. When it was before it became really sexy and all the right. TV shows started, yeah. and they said exactly the same thing that it had become so popular and so many kids were doing it, thinking that's exactly what it was going to be like. Yeah. Okay, I've got a question for you though. Did yeah. you ever watch Dexter? Yeah, I love Dexter. Dexter you love Dexter? Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the whole concept behind it of the forensic scientist being a serial killer as well. I thought really, but but with a sense of justice. So like. Not like most serial killer psychopaths who wouldn't think it. Dexter had this sense of justice. Of, he did. Know, right or wrong. Yeah, the dark passenger. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so that's oh, good. I wasn't sure whether you watched any of those shows or not. So you watched all the CSI ones. They do oh. move fast. Oh, yeah. Like CSI didn't really. I wasn't into CSI as much, but Dexter was cool. Yeah. Okay, so why did you leave it? Were you enjoying it? I was for years, but I got to a point where I, I didn't feel like I was going. Like, I. I felt, felt like I'd done that. It was like I'd been there, done that. I had uh, been to murder scenes. I'd managed murder scenes. I'd managed different kinds of scenes. And I just got to a point where I wanted something fresh, something different. And my wife had jumped from career. So she was a school teacher. Yeah. Went off to study and become a lawyer. So I thought, all right, it's my turn. I'm going to do something completely different. When you went from the army, though, to the yeah. police force or become yeah. a crime scene investigator, yeah. 
what made you want to leave the army? Was it not fulfilling? I, was it I, okay? I was only on what I was called the ready reserves. So I had a weird contract that I had to do. And a lot of my yeah. mates stayed on full time. And I loved the army, with like going over to Malaysia and stuff, getting heaps of jungle warfare training and things like that. That was awesome. <laughs> but it was like an adventure. And that's yeah. what I loved about it. But I, I always thought, yeah, no, I wouldn't I want to get into forensics or something. So I'd say, no, nah, I'm gonna when I get out, I'm gonna do forensics. So I stayed reserved for a while while doing forensics and yeah, that was cool. But yeah, I just moved on from there. I, I'm a little bit like that in life sometimes. I, I wanna try the next adventure sometimes. Yeah, well, I do have a friend who was a chiropractor. I met him as a chiropractor. Yeah. Had a really successful chiropractic business. And then we were talking one day, and as I got to talk to him, before he was a, a chiropractor, he was a firefighter. Yeah. And before he was a firefighter, he was a school teacher. Yeah. And then he eventually, he sold his chiropractic clinics, got out of chiropractic. Oh, clinic. wow. That's very yeah. different, isn't it? Yeah. It just, from one, I mean, just these completely different careers. And I, so you've pretty much done the same thing. You're in the army, in the police force, but as a civilian, crime yeah. scene investigation. Yeah. So... The big question is, moving into podiatry, yep. well, hang on, I'll go back a step. So what made you, you see that your wife decided to do law, you decided that, hey, okay, I'm going to do something else too, just to That's keep right. life interesting. How yeah. did you choose podiatry? To be honest, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I knew I wanted to do something sort of health related where I was helping people. But podiatry, I ended up doing work experience with a chiro, a physio, and a podiatrist, each for one day. Mm. And, and I thought, I'll do work experience. Oh, so I rang up the different clinics and said, can I do a work experience? Came in for a day, sat next to them, saw what they did for the day. And I thought, wow, well, podiatry is pretty cool. They do, it's, yeah, it's feet and legs, but there's so much to it. I thought, oh, this would be interesting. So, yeah, I reckon physiotherapy, myself personally, I think physiotherapy would be boring. Yeah. Oh, I, I was ready to go by lunchtime. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought this this isn't for me. I don't want to be massaging people all day. Ah, oh, I know. And you meet some big hairy dude on the bench, and you've got to rub your fingers through through that matting of hair, <laughs> yeah. especially around his glutes. And I'm going, uh, no, nah, no thanks. No, that that just wouldn't work for me. So you chose podiatry from yeah. that. Yeah. And as you were getting into it, how'd you find it? Obviously, you're still doing it, so you enjoyed it, but. Yeah. No, I, I like I didn't make it I didn't make the choice easy for myself because I was living in Canberra and where I was studying was Western Sydney in Campbelltown. Yeah. So I, was, I was commuting up to Sydney twice a week to go into uni, but I took a one one week at a time and thought, no, this is what I want to do. This is pretty cool. How and old I, were you at the time when you decided to do that? It was about ten years ago. So oh about thirty three. Okay. Yeah. I thought, yeah, look. I commute up and yeah, did the classes and I thought, no, I was a mature age student. So I, I guess I knew what I was giving up and I treated study like work. So I thought, well, during these hours, I'm going to be studying and I had family at the same time. So I thought, look, I've got to take it serious. And yeah, it got through it, which, which was nice and good. Were you allowed to work part-time as a crime scene investigator while you were studying? Oh, not really. I was kind of been there and done that. To be honest, I was a bit burnt out from crime scene work. I mean, very sort of heavy kind of job. I guess life expectancy or in the job, job expectancy is about three to four years. So after 11 years, I was like, all right, I need to change now. I need to do something different. Is that like, right? Pe people get out that early? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's, yeah, very full on. But, is it is it because of what you're seeing constantly? And plus, you yeah, don't know what you're going to see every time yeah, you go to a, a crime scene. Yeah, it's a lot of what you see, and it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of what you see, definitely. Yeah, but I guess saying that too, like I got to the point where it might. It probably sounds fascinating to you going to a scene, but I got to the point where the scene is it was going to a scene was boring. It was like I could do it in my sleep. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like, anything long enough, and. And you, it becomes routine. It was it was work. Like at yeah. the start, it's all excitement and you think, oh yeah, this is cool. Rocking up the scene and there's a newspaper over there and you're you're going in collecting the evidence and coming across who knows what. But after a while it, it became a bit mundane, a bit routine. Yeah, and I suppose even people might say, Oh, but podiatry would be the same thing. However, the person 
that you're dealing with is always going to be different and they're yeah. alive. Yeah, so right. I assume right. when you're going to a dead body, the personality is irrelevant. No, they, right. So yeah, no, I, could, right. I could understand it is really the same thing. Yeah, yeah and that's what I love to quiet dietary too. I mean, the clients make our job. The conversations you get in when you're treating people, that's, that's what I find fascinating. You know, some of the most interesting people I've met have been since being a podiatrist, and that's really cool. Yeah, that's what the podcast is like too. Yeah. Because when I, when I get people on here, yeah. I know very little about my guests other than what I've read online. Yeah. And we may have exchanged an email or message backwards and forwards, but I really don't know what I'm going to get. Yeah. And, and that makes it exciting. And I've, out of 300 or whatever episodes, 300 something episodes I've done so far, no one has really disappointed me. Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah. I think maybe I, I just know how to vet and, and yeah, I know yeah. how to choose my guests wisely based on what they've done. Plus I, I go and do a bit of stalking through their social media profiles yeah. <laughs> and you can just see, but you yeah. can see the interaction they have with people. So I'm fortunate nobody has, nobody has really put me off my game. Oh, there's one, there was oh, one, really? there oh, was okay. one, but, but I never released the episode. Yeah, fair enough. I've actually got about four or five episodes that have never been released. Oh, okay. They're in yeah. the dark files. They'll come out one year, will they? They're in the dark files. I know, and the people are probably sitting back going, oh, what? when's he ever, is, is he ever <laughs> going to release that? Is, is, why did he hold my episode back? Why wasn't it released? So yeah. there's, always a, there's always a reason. Yeah. Okay. So back on to you. <laughs> With what you did in the past, mm-hmm. being a crime scene investigator, I take it this very step-by-step process of things you had to go through. You had to follow a lot of systems. You couldn't just wing it. No, How have you found the oh, the detail of probably what you had to do there with your work today has, has there been a lot of help or... there's a lot of similarities i reckon like you think it's completely two different careers but there's a lot of like shared skills like say between them so i mean think about like back then i was analyzing a scene nowadays i'm analyzing a person yeah so my evidence that i'm collecting is what are they saying what am i saying what am i doing so it's still like and I think as dietists, we're doing a lot of the critical sort of thinking skills and analytic skills. So there, there's, like, there are a lot of similarities. Yeah, and you've got to interpret the evidence yeah. that you found. You've yeah, got to definitely. interpret the information that you gather from a patient as well. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I, I think both of them need pretty good communication skills too. Because you're talking with a patient, you, you, know, you need to win them over, really. Yeah. Yeah. So out of curiosity, when you were on the in a crime scene yep. were you you were only ever gathering the evidence from the crime scene were you ever talking to witnesses oh. or gathering anything from them as well or was that was purely oh. the police no sometimes a little bit so when i was especially at the start so like in forensics you don't just jump straight into the murder scenes and you're doing that I yeah mean, you start out by helping them but you start out and the, they call them the volume crime so the stolen cars, the break and enter scene, that's where, that's where you sort of cut your teeth with. So, volume crimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you go into people's houses and you're chatting to you're chatting to the lady who's had a window smashed and they've stolen her handbag and you're going there fingerprinting that and you, you're learning your skills at the at the volume scenes. Yeah. And you're interacting with people all the time. And we, they used to use us for field intelligence because we'd be going in sort of plain clothes doing it and a lot of people would come and go, oh, I think the neighbour down the street is the guy who did it. Because I, I think they see the police uniform and a bit intimidated, but True. Those, they're, yeah, people are a lot happier to sort of give you a bit of info. So, yeah, it was, yeah, did, it was like that. Did you ever do any jobs where you're you're gathering all the evidence, doing the fingerprints, doing everything, and straight away you've just looked and gone, this is an inside job? Yeah. They've, they've set this up. I can just tell they've set oh. this up because of this, this and this. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've been to a job, like there was one scene that I went to and I went there and there was, I went to this job and there was this SS Commodore in the garage that was pretty new and it was covered in mud and it had been completely smashed up down the side. And I got to the scene and the people said, yeah, I've come downstairs and in the garage, here's my car, it's completely smashed up. And it was covered in mud, completely smashed up. I don't know what's happened. Yeah. But I'm, I'm analysing going, okay, wait a second. This hasn't happened here. There's no, like, glass on the ground. There's no mud around. This has happened somewhere else. 
but there was no forced entry. We have used the key to get in. And then my next question eventually was, all right, so do you have any kids? And they said, oh, yeah, I've got one, one 17 year old son. I went, oh, okay. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. He didn't by chance take the car out for a spin. No, 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 he's a good kid. He'd never do that. So I kept analyzing the job. And then, oh, it would have been about half an hour later, he, um, the 17 year old son came down and go, yeah, it was my 17th birthday. And I thought I'd take out dad's car. And I, I sort of cranked it into a tree. So I've driven it back and parked it in the garage. And I thought, Wait. <laughs> Should have left it where it was. I know, I know. And done a runner. Yeah, I know. You know, but, uh, you know that was that was quite like quite obvious, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering with so we're doing podiatry now, yeah. and because you see, there's podiatrists that are forensic podiatrists who get involved mm -hmm. in that aspect and they become witnesses for different crimes where they'll investigate footprints. Do you see yourself doing that at any stage? No, I'm kind of, I, I kind of feel like I've been there, done that. Yeah. Like a forensic podiatry, yeah, that's pretty cool. But I've done shoe mark evidence and all that. And being crime scene in the forensic world was kind of the pinnacle. So I've always said, I, when I first came to podiatrist, podiatry association said, why don't you become a forensic podiatrist? You know, we need more forensic podiatrists. And I feel like, Look, I've been to court. I've been there, done that, and yeah. me, I kind of was saying, "Well, look, I'm happy to help someone else who's doing that because I've had experience in that." But yeah, I've been in and out of court before and done that. You know, done that a hundred times. That it's it's not for me. Uh, I, I totally get that. It's well, it's probably no different to someone who's worked with elite sports teams before doing podiatry. Yeah, and then a lot of the times you'll talk to those people. And somebody say, oh, you're going to get involved in elite sports. And they go, why would I want to do that? Yeah, I, right. I know what that's like. I've been in that myself. Yeah. Yeah. It's the last place I want to go back to because yeah. it's it's not exciting. Whereas someone who's never done it, yep. that yeah, sounds exactly. exciting. You know, yeah, and it, and it would be like, I found forensics exciting for years. That's why I did it. And I'm happy to help anyone else who is a forensic podiatrist if they ever want a second opinion or something or go through their evidence. Happy to help that. As long as I'm not one presenting it in court. I'm <laughs> <laughs> but I suppose it is one of the things, like going back to the conversation just a little bit earlier, when yeah. you're saying what you learnt being a crime scene investigator and yeah. asking questions, because it's not just no. mur murder cases, no, it's right. e even the yeah, high volume crimes, yep. asking those questions now working with patients, you're doing the same yeah. thing. You're asking questions exactly. to get to the, the actual, the root of the problem. Yeah, to so get a diagnosis or like you're observing the patient, if you send something, hey, this doesn't fit right, why am I saying what I'm saying? Is there something else going on? I think it's, you know, the observations that you're seeing uh, on the people at the time of where you go with it, I guess. Yeah, I remember the head of our podiatry department at the time, Alan Crawford, and he used to always say to us, if you ask enough questions, the patients will tell you everything you need to know. Yeah. You just got to not jump to assumptions, which same thing you didn't do as a crime scene investigator. But, yeah, you, that's right. you just got to keep gathering the evidence, yeah. keep asking the right questions, and everything will start to reveal itself. Yeah, they call that deductive reasoning. So you've got to deduce what every the evidence that you've been presented with. So, like I think I was reading something: seventy percent of any diagnosis is on what someone tells you. So I read this study, um, uh, something, I think it was a GP study that they said 70% of their diagnosis should be on what someone tells you. So if you're not communicating with the patient, you're missing out on a lot of evidence there. Yeah, and that was that was 70%, you said? Yeah. Yeah, 70%. so that's, that's a high number. Yeah. And it is, and that's pretty much what Alan Crawford was saying. If you ask them enough questions, they'll, they'll give you the whole history and you yep. dig a little bit further and they'll give you a little bit more and you slowly just start putting all these pieces together and it should yeah. give you a really good idea of what's happening. Whereas sometimes someone will get one or two bits of the last two questions, dive in with what they think is, is happening and then they wonder why treatment doesn't work. Yeah, 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 no. And look... I've probably been guilty of that too. I think we all have. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Especially you know, when you're a new graduate and you come out oh, yeah. and somebody says, oh, I've got, and they're pointing, you go, I think I know what it is. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's, that's why my mum used to always say to me, 
you can't put a you can't put an old head on young shoulders. Yeah. And I used to go, oh, settle down, mum. <laughs> yeah, like I just shake my head. She used to say to me all the time, you can't put an old head on young shoulders. And I go, yeah. I don't want an old head on these shoulders. <laughs> I like my head. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I want my head to stay the way it is. But then as I got older, she gave me some other advice that I can't I can't say on the podcast. But as I got older, then all of a sudden it started to click that the longer you're in podiatry or life in general, the more mistakes you make, the more experience you get, and the more experience you get, hopefully you don't keep making the same mistakes. And I remember saying to my mum once, I hate admitting this, mum, but you were right. <laughs> she, she still reminds you of that now, does. I know, now she tells me, remember when I was right? I go, yes, <laughs> yes, yes right. I do. I do recall saying that. To, I do regrettably remember saying that to you. Yeah. So with podiatry itself, do you like all aspects of podiatry? What was it that you liked about nail surgery? What I liked about it was, I guess, I found it the most scariest and challenging thing at the university. Okay. But I thought, this is, this is the most challenging. This is the thing that's scaring me the most. I want to be good at this because it was scaring everybody. I want to be good at this. So I want to immerse myself into this. So that was one of the reasons why with one of the first clinics I went to, well, the first clinic I went to was a clinic that did lots of surgery. I wanted to immerse myself into that. And I like surgery. I like I like a bit of blood and gore. I think that's... Yeah. You know, yeah. Of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's even better when they're living. So I'm moving up in the world. But yeah. No, oh, good. before we go any further, I forgot to ask you that too. So when yeah. you graduated, your yeah. goal, you searched out someone who did nail surgery a lot that's what you wanted to do or did you just yeah. get so the job somewhere else first like, like I, was, I was in canberra and i mean we're we're desperate for podiatrists in canberra so i went I, there was a few clinics i was lucky with all of my placements being western sydney they always gave me the canberra placements because everyone wanted to stay in sydney and i said oh yeah if there's any canberra placements so i was lucky to be able to have different placements at the different clinics in canberra which was really cool it is one of those places. I like Canberra. Been there a few times. I know it gets a bad rap, but I actually think it's a nice place. And I'm surprised. Like I always say, when people are trying to employ another podiatrist, yep. and I always say, sell the sizzle. What yeah. is it? You live there for a reason. Why do you live there? That's what you need to get across to the, to the new graduates coming through. And if you can do that, because I know when I graduated, there was always a job going in Canberra. Mm. And every year after, there was always the same job going in Canberra. And I just thought Canberra just had politicians. I didn't realise how nice it was, uh, yeah, the, the well, area itself. Canberra is, definitely, Canberra is definitely a lot better. Like Canberra, growing up in Canberra, I didn't think the same. That's why I needed to get out of Canberra. Because yeah. back, you know, quite a good food scene. We got, you know, um, places to eat, drink. And, oh, yeah. Grease Monkey Burgers. They're good. Oh, yeah, Grease Monkey is good. Grease Monkey as a sponsor. If anyone from Grease Monkey is listening to this. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> now, they make good burgers. But it's, okay, so you've decided to stay in Canberra and then you loved the challenge of nail surgery. Yeah. So, so how many have you done? Yeah, I've probably done close to 500 surgeries. Okay, that's good. I, I, used, to, I used to enjoy them. Yeah, but... 500 in about five years. So, yeah. And that's an area that you want to just keep building it up. Yeah, yeah, that aspect of podiatry? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm interested in other areas of podiatry, but that was always the part that I enjoyed the most. I, I mentioned it to you off air, and I've said it to people before, that I'm surprised in podiatry more people aren't picking aspects of podiatry or niches and just really driving that home and becoming one of the best known in that particular area. Yeah. And I think nail surgery, if you're in a town with 30 podiatrists, Look at them all. Who is actually putting the hand up saying, we're the nail surgery place? Yeah, and that's what, that's what I want to do. That's my goal. I want to be known as, that's my thing, the, the person to go to if you've got an ingrown planner. When did you open? It's only very recent, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So today is day five. Oh, day five. <laughs> yeah. So by the time this podcast comes out, which I'm releasing this one really soon, it'll be about okay. day 10. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay, cool. So we're recording this on a Friday and I'm going to release it on a Tuesday, I think. Awesome. So I'll be day nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. wow. Yeah. So everyone will know that this is really fresh new information that, yeah, they're, yeah, that yeah. they're listening to. 
Yeah. So other than the ingrown toenail side of things, and yeah. that's an area that you want to build up long term, what were the other aspects of podiatry that you sort of really floated your boat? Look, I, I don't mind general treatments. I love the conversation that I have with people. I mean, a lot of people, general treatments aren't for them. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, for me, I love, I love hanging with the, some of the oldies and getting into their stories and their histories and things like that. And I find that fascinating. And I don't mind, look, biomechanicals are, are, are good too. I don't mind a little bit of the range for the others as well. I always say that if there's parts of podiatry you don't like, just don't do it. Yeah, yeah. Find yeah. find another podiatrist that you actually get on with who does like that. And yeah, just refer, exactly. refer them across to them. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah, at the moment I'm being a new clinic. I'm happy with my podiatrist camera to take whoever comes through the door. Yeah, I oh, know. I think when you when you open your business initially, I think it's especially if it's your first one. Yeah see everybody because you don't know you really don't know as it goes on as you start seeing more patients you might think you like a certain thing a lot yep. but then you don't know what happens see i used to i used to love doing nail surgery absolutely oh, okay. loved it cool. yeah did so many of them I had hundreds and hundreds just yep. did so many of them yep. and then this one particular day i had this kid in who was about 12 and i've told the story on the podcast before but i'm going to yeah. tell it again because it's a good story yeah and did the injection, everything's fine. Everything, I've never had one go, never had one not work. Yeah. 100% success rate. And if people don't believe me, I'll tell you, I'll put my kid's life on it, that <laughs> I have never had one go bad. Yeah. Done this one on this 12-year-old kid, just about to start the procedure, driving the thing underneath the nail, and all of a sudden he goes, fuck. Oh, okay. And I've gone, holy shit, my heart just oh, hit the man. floor. Yeah. Never had that happen before. Yeah. And I looked at him and said, can you feel that? He goes, no, nah, I'm just messing with you. Oh, what a bastard. Little shit. And <laughs> little turd. Yeah. I looked at him and I won't say exactly what I said because his dad laughed or his mum laughed who was in the room. And I, I whoa, oh, and, and I, just, I went cold. I went really cold after it. And then I, I finished it. Called him a little shit a few more times. <laughs> he still laughed. He still laughing all the way through it. He came back. Oh, yeah, had to go. He said, "Oh yeah, it's great." I said, "No, it's a shame. I was hoping this was going to be the one that didn't work, and you were going to be in a lot right. of pain." That's right. And but everything, everything all worked in the end. What a little smart. And, like... and, and the thing is, I know I didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. I know it was all fine. I know he was messing with me. Yeah. And I did a few after, that, and I could probably do one if I had to do one tomorrow. I could yeah. do it. Yeah. But I, my enjoyment of doing them no, just that. disappeared. Yeah, no, that sucks. Yeah, if I bumped into him, I'd still call him little shit. Yeah, <laughs> probably a big shit nowadays. He's probably a bigger <laughs> shit than me. Yeah, but yeah, but it's one. That's what I was saying. I think yeah. it's great to know or understand all the aspects because, it, like, same thing. If I'd only had an ingrown toenail clinic, and that's all I did, and that happened to me, whew, I'd right. have been stuffed. Exactly. Exactly. So I, yeah. I would have had to get. I would have had to get psychological help to get over it. <laughs> to just get get back on the bike. That's right. <laughs> so where do, where do you see yourself in the future? Where do you see your clinic developing as time goes on? Ooh, good question. I see myself growing, but I'm wary about growing too quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I'm still debating of where I'm wanting to go. I've got enough. I've got room here. So the clinic that I bought has enough space. I've got three treatment rooms. Yeah. I'm using one, considering maybe at the time being getting a, either a physio or nurse practitioner or someone else, allied health, to um, take the other rooms. But, when, when you said bought the practice, you say you bought the building? Yeah, I did. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it wasn't existing practice that you bought the podiatry clinic? No. No, so you've bought the building and, and set it all up yourself. Yeah, yeah. It's Which good. goes to last week's episode, which yeah. about the benefits of purchasing your own premises. Ah, there you go. I need to listen. I need to catch up with last, uh, last week's one. <laughs> no, but it's good though. So you've pretty much, like I said, you've gone through your career, army, crime scene investigator. Obviously, you saved enough money to go back to uni. Did you say you've got children as well? Yeah, yeah. You went back to uni while you had kids as well. Yeah, it was a good way of... I feel uni in Campbelltown was a good way of having a bit of space from kids. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I don't make, like I know when I went through, yeah. the mature age students, other than I 
couldn't understand why they were there because I thought they were, they were close to retirement at 33. Yeah. When you're 18, oh. people at 33 look really old. Oh, that's right. Yeah. You know, I felt like the old, the old fella. <laughs> yeah. But I, I remember all the ones that went through and they were all, yeah, I look back now, and I, even though like I was impressed that they were doing it at their age, yeah. but I look back now and I'm even more impressed because most of them were married, had children, had commitments, yeah. and here they were while well, we were all just studying and drinking. Yeah. They were actually studying. They had occasional drink with us, but yeah. then had to get on with uh, adult life. Yeah, well, I, I was the same. I mean, my first degree, that's what all I was doing was studying and drinking first degree. It yeah. was kind of like I've been there, done that. So second one, I, you know what you're giving up when you're doing it. So I, I thought, look, I don't want to really fail my subjects because I know that I'm giving up time with family now, having a commute and giving up income and things like that. So, yeah. One thing I want to finish up on, or yeah. one thing I want to talk about before we finish up was yeah, sure. I asked you, yeah, did you have any talking points? And you said, oh, no, I'm pretty flexible. Talk about your background and transitioning yeah. and priority, which we've done. Yeah. Life lessons, but you were talking about also having a positive mindset. Yeah, definitely. And, and that's just something I want to talk about before we finish up. Yeah. When you're thinking positive mindset, what yeah. do you mean by it? Like really much a growth mindset so i think everyone likes to do what they're good at and i think we see that with patients sometimes you know the person who comes in who's always doing weightlifting they want to be doing those kinds of exercise but they're the ones who are needing to be doing the stretching or vice versa we're very good at working at what we're good at but i think sometimes we need it it's good to be a bit of balance in our life and working on it parts of us that we're not good at and mm. growing those sort of areas as well. So yeah, I'm very much for growth mindset and life learning. Okay. And what, and what do you do for yourself in that area? What, what do you do to challenge yourself in that whole growth area? Well, t- at the moment, uh, learning small business. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> business is fun. Have you got a copy of my book? Yeah, I do. I loved your book. Okay, that's great. I absolutely loved your book. And I was going to reread it actually. I, I've misplaced it somewhere, so I've got to find it again. But I was, it was, yeah, it was a brilliant book. I, there was a lot of gems in that. So, yeah. It's funny. Um, it's, it's funny. Every now and then I'll pick it up to just flick through something. Yeah. And, I, and I, I'll read through the book and I go, geez, you're in the zone when you wrote this one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, I, when, you, when you wrote the book and when I read it, I just thought, yeah, wow. He's got the, he's definitely got his finger on the pulse there. So. Yeah, so it's good because that one person in the UK who gave me that one star, <laughs> which I still, yeah, still, <laughs> still makes me laugh. Very personal too, because everyone should go and find the comic because it's, it's very, it's quite funny. Yeah. Emil, I think the guy's person, the guy, I'm, I'm assuming it's a guy, just the yeah. way it was written because a woman would never be that rude. No. And man, it was so personal because he used my name twice. Yeah, wow. And I'm like, oh. Oh, mustn't like me. I must have done something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I agree with this whole growth mindset thing because if somebody had told me when I was in my thirties, early thirties or something, that oh you'll have a podcast, even though I wouldn't have known what that was, mm. but I would be interviewing people or I'd be up on stage in Liverpool in front of a thousand people giving a presentation, yeah. I wouldn't have believed them because I was terrified of public speaking oh me too me too so even you said this is your first podcast isn't it yeah definitely yeah first podcast so yeah yeah hang on that's great because I've, I've got some sound effects that i should hang on which one is it ah i oh. shouldn't have used the laughter one <laughs> that was the wrong one hang on no i didn't tell any jokes <laughs> oh, here we go so this is your first podcast you yeah, get some applause good. and turns up yeah. there we go <laughs> i don't use the sound effects very often Oh, they're cool. Yeah. Oh, hang on. No. Oh, oh that's... Cash yeah, it's cash register. Yeah, it's cash So if you say something really cool, you can go, oh, hey, that was a money... That comment was worth it. There's certain people who listen to this podcast who know we carry on a bit, and there's other people who listen to it who wait for me to just mention something about money or something tacky <laughs> so that they can write a negative comment. So for you people, there we go. That's for you. So... Simon, have you got anything else you want to say before we wrap up? Um, no, not really. No, not really. It's been an awesome experience. 
no, just thank you. No, I thank you. As soon as I asked you to come on, you said yes straight away. There was a little bit of hesitation in, in between the lines I could read. But I'm glad you said yes because I just knew it was going to be interesting. Thank you. And um, when, a, when I'm in Canberra, we're going to have a grease, yeah, grease definitely. monkey burger definitely. together. I'm holding you to that. So, yeah. Oh, no, and definitely. And I'm thinking about coming up your way to do one of your courses as well. Okay, yes. So, well, if people are listening to this at the moment, the next two-day podiatry business reboot is on the 26th and 27th of July up here in Cairns. Go to my website, tysonfranklin.com. All the details are there. So thanks for mentioning that. No problem. Now, are, you, are you doing a course for... You're doing business reboot, but are you doing one for new business course? Well, the, the business well, the business reboot. Yep. The way that it's actually set up, it wouldn't matter whether it's your twentieth year or you've just opened. Okay. The the okay. things that we actually go through are like the like on my website I have this model there called the thriving podiatry business model. Yeah. Everybody's business, regardless of whether you've been established for a long time or you're just started, needs to run on that model. Yeah, okay. And because without it, you just like you could still be making a lot of money, but with the model, you'd be making more. If you're just starting out, the sooner you apply the model, the faster things will fall into place. Brilliant. So it was just, it's like when I wrote the book that yeah. I look back at the book now and I go, wow, where? Even I'm impressed with what I wrote sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so with the, the 12 week reboot, the way that it sort of came together, when I first developed it, there were 12 people in the original group and I was sort of, I'd had part of, I had half of it put together, but the other half, I didn't put it together until I knew who was in the group. And in the group, there were people who were just starting. There'd been people who'd been there for 20 years. So as I was putting the information together, it sort of catered for everybody and it just, it just worked. But every time I do it, and because I'm always reading books and going to other conferences myself, I'm yeah. always taking little bits of it and it's getting better each time that I do it. Brilliant. So that's the fun part. So yes, if you come up here, yeah. uh, yes, I'll take you to the best burger place in Cairns. Wonderful. No, that sounds great. I'd love okay. to. Okay, Simon, so thank you very much for uh, coming on the Podiatry Legends podcast, and I look forward to talking again very soon. Definitely. Thanks, mate.